Hey, come on, let me hear you go, church. How you feel today? Feel good? How about those of you in the back? Come on, make some noise if you love Jesus. Come on, somebody. That's what I'm talking about. You know, I was thinking about uh, gathering together today and how I don't ever want to take for granted moments like these. Over two years ago when the pandemic hit, we were isolated and quarantined and had to preach to an empty room and many of you were isolated and while there were little benefits to that along the way, come on, we are better together, aren't we? Uh, we celebrate each other, we encourage each other, and it's just good to be together. So I'm honored that you're here today. I know you've been greeted a few times here at Go Church, but I just want to take a moment to tell you I love you from my family to your family, from my heart to your heart. We love you. We thank God for you. So we're really glad that you're here. Also, everybody watching online with our online campus, we greet all of you. Hey, mama, love you too. My mom's always watching online. Come on now. You got to be careful with the stories you tell with a mama that listens, right? But we greet everybody online and then our Germantown, Maryland campus family. Many of you know this. We're one church, multiple locations. We greet all of you. So, all right, you're a part of the second gathering here today. You got a big job. You set the tone, not only for this room, but everybody online and in Germantown. So can you put your hands together? Come on and greet everybody, your extended church family. There we go. Yeah. yeah. Love it. We also have this weekly tradition here, and it's more than a tradition. It's really who we are. The Bible talks about giving honor, and so we always pause to give honor to the brave men and women that serve in the military and work as first responders. Uh, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your commitment. Thank you for your obedience. And I pray that this moment of applause and appreciation just really fills your heart with some encouragement. We thank God for you, and we celebrate you today. So come on, church family. The loudest applause for a group of people. Come on. Yeah, yeah. So for a few weeks, uh, we've been talking about that this particular Sunday was going to be Vision Sunday. But if you trust your pastor here, I'll let you know why we're going to postpone Vision Sunday by one week. All right. So next week, we'll pick up with Vision Sunday. And there's two primary reasons. The, the first reason is because, and this is my heart, I believe that God has opened up some doors of opportunity and he's blessed us because of our obedience and faithfulness during the 21 days of prayer and fasting. And these doors aren't just good doors that we're walking through. These are God doors that we're walking through. And how many of you know that God does things suddenly? Come on. And so in the last couple of weeks, God has opened up some opportunities for us that I want to make sure we cross every T, we dot every I, get this in front of the board, and then make an announcement to you about a couple of strategic things that are happening here at Go Church. And so if you'll trust us with that process, we'll delay Vision Sunday by one Sunday. And then the second reason that I wanted to delay Vision Sunday, and I'm not trying to over-spiritualize this by any means, and I'm always very guarded when I say, thus saith the Lord, but I believe that God put a word in my heart for today, and I want to be more obedient to the Holy Spirit than I am to a preaching calendar. Come on, do you appreciate that? So I got a word for you today. I'm going to share it with you. Before we get into that, I'll pray for you. Let's make a deal. You ready? I pray for you. You pray for me. Is that good? All right, let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your people. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your presence. I sense your presence in this room, and I'm grateful for that. Your word tells us where two or three gather together in your name, you'll be right in the midst. And so we thank you that you're in the midst of it all. And we honor you, Jesus. We glorify you. We give you praise. We got one job today, and here's the job. Scripture says, if I, Jesus, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all the people to me. So we've got one job today. One job as we gather together, one job as we have community together, one job as we sing worship songs, one job as we pray for one another, one job as the preaching of the word goes forth, and that is to lift high the name of Jesus, to give you the praise. It's not about me being elevated on a platform, it's about you being seated in the seat of the Most High. And so we honor you, Jesus. I speak against distraction today. Give me clarity of thought and speech. Give your people clarity of hearing to receive your word. And may all of us walk out of this room different than the way we came in. Come on, anybody with me? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all God's people said amen and amen. Now, can we clap for King Jesus? Come on, the best praise you've got. There we go. Good. Okay, so I did tell you that this Sunday was going to be Vision Sunday. We're going to postpone all of that to next week, except 
for one announcement, one announcement that I want to bring to you today, and that's because we had already booked the flight and made the plans, and so I want to invite to the platform uh, David Waldrop, who's been serving as our campus pastor of our Germantown, Maryland campus for quite a few years now. As he walks out, would you give him a big thank you and round of applause? Come on, let's go. Which, by the way, I'm really glad earlier that when you had us turn and greet each other that you finished the thought with give each other the finger guns. Finger guns. For a yes, moment, yes. I got real nervous. Come on, somebody. No, no, you got nervous too. That's for Interstate 85. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Now, anytime, let's, let's just be honest, anytime that we bring a staff person out on the platform, typically it revolves around transition. And so some of you are thinking, okay, there's going to be a transition here. And there is a transition, but it's in a good way. And so Pastor David is, is not leaving the team here at Go Church, and aren't you thankful for that? I know I'm thankful for that. Love our team, love, love Pastor David and our squad. Last year, 2021, at the beginning of the year, the Lord put in my heart, and we set this as a top priority, to restructure our organizational flow. So if you look at an organization with a flow chart, to kind of reevaluate that with our heart to continue to grow and reach people in this county, Montgomery County, and our heart to continue to plant campuses. So as a part of that restructuring, I presented Pastor David with an opportunity. And he was one of a couple of individuals on our staff that I presented with this opportunity. We created what we call an executive leadership team. And on that executive leadership team sits Don Stevens, who's our COO, uh, Pastor Jeff Merriman, who's been a part of this church for a really long time. I don't want to say how old you are, but you were Kimberly's middle school youth pastor. So I just thought I'd throw that out there. Um, obviously, you know Pastor Ben Warwick, who has been serving as our campus pastor. He's in Alaska today, preaching in Alaska. Come on. And, uh, and then recently, I've invited Pastor David to come and to sit on that executive leadership team as what we're calling an associate pastor. So the announcement is this, is that with that promotion, uh, it had one string attached, one requirement, and that would be for him to pray with him and his wife to pray about relocating from Germantown back to the south side of Atlanta here. Now, what's interesting is, is that this is actually his hometown. Born and raised on the playground is where he spent most of his most, days. Most of those days were there. Come on, how many of you know that? Come on, uh, you ain't too holy. Don't act too holy. And so I asked him, would you, and Esther, which I got a picture of them because she's a lot prettier than he is. Come on now. And every married man said amen. Come on. Amen. We all married up. So I asked uh, Pastor David and Esther to begin to pray about this opportunity to accept the promotion to relocate from Germantown back to Atlanta. And I'd just like to announce to you that they will be here beginning the first week of April. Come on, somebody. Isn't that awesome? Oh, come on. All right. Now, in the first gathering, some people stood. I Someone watched. Nobody, in this region stood yeah, up. No, yeah, so, hey, take 30, 45 seconds yeah. here. Just talk about your excitement, a little bit about what God's doing in your heart yeah. and this season of transition. Honestly, just really honored. Uh, this is a, a, a bittersweet opportunity because we love our Germantown family yes. so, so much. And the best thing about this being a church with multiple campuses is we don't have to leave, we just have to move. And yeah. so that will still be our, our family from 700 miles away. But for Esther and I both, we're excited to get down here, honored to be a part. This church has always been family to me. Uh, you and Kimberly's leadership has always been a blessing to my life. And I, I really am. I'm just really, really honored and humbled by this. And I'm eager to just get plugged in and to learn. And so thank you all for not booing when he said this news. <laughs> really, really appreciate that. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Hey, it wouldn't be an appropriate Pastor JC announcement if I didn't poke a little bit of fun at David. So born and raised here, Kimberly and I had the privilege to be his youth pastor uh, when, well, you were part of kids ministry when Kimberly led worship for kids. She did. And then, of course, a part of middle school, high school. He did an internship here. And then when Kimberly and I moved to Maryland in 2013 to start Go Church, David followed us. And uh, two weeks later, he was up there. He's been in Germantown ever since, leading that beautiful uh, campus of people there. But I text his mom, Kimberly texted his mom last night and said, hey, we need a few pictures of David as he grew up through the years here at church. So come on. I mean, you just got to, you know what I'm saying? Come on. I mean, look at that. Look, look. There's a face you want to punch, isn't it? Just right. <laughs> I mean, hey, but we love you. We thank God for you. And Germantown already knows this. I went up there on first Wednesday of February, announced to that location, you know, what God was doing. We've promoted Pastor Eric Somasundrum, who's been on staff since August as a campus pastor there. They're in good hands. We're in good hands because we serve a really good God. Amen. So Amen. can you just buy a round of applause, encourage Pastor David, affirm yeah. this decision. All right. Thank you guys. Love you, man. Great. Good. 
All right, let's get, let's get into it. So if you allow me the grace, we'll do Vision Sunday with all the other great announcements next week. Today, though, we're going to finish, I promise, we're going to finish getting the game. We've been in the series now since the first Sunday of January. This is the eighth Sunday. Come on, the eighth Sunday. And I'm just going to put it out there. Have you enjoyed any week of this entire series? Come on, there's got to be at least one week, right? One week. So like we do every Sunday, take out a sermon note card, a message note card, and a seat back pocket right in front of you. If you've got a journal, take out your journal. If you use your smartphone to take notes, just flip it on airplane mode so you don't get distracted. This has kind of been the whole theme of, of the entire conversation around getting the game. And here's the thought. This year's not going to be any different from last year or the previous years unless you make a decision. And that's a key word that you need to write down. You've got a decision to make. You've got the power to choose, right, to make a choice to do some things differently than what you've done last year or in previous years. So if you want a different result in any area of your life, you've got to start to do some things in a different way. Tomorrow's President's Day. Most of you knew that, so I thought it would be appropriate to quote a particular president, Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States of America. Uh, he was the principal author of the Declaration of Independence, and here's what he said, and it really just ties so much in with this particular theme for our series. He says, if you want something you've never had, you've got to be willing to do something you've never done. Now, I don't know if Thomas Jefferson was Pastor Thomas, but that will preach. Come on now. If you want something you've never had, then you've got to be willing to do something that you've never done. And that's been the challenge through this whole series. The idea of getting the game is... Well, we all love sports. It's not, a, it's not a sports series. It's the idea of you and I are not called, when we come into the faith with Jesus, we're not called to be spectators in this thing. We're called to be participators. God's calling us to get in the game. And our heart this year is for you to grow deeper. And so the first seven weeks of this series, this is what we've looked at. We've looked at what does it mean to get in the game with the discipline of prayer? What does it mean to get in the game with the discipline of, of fasting? In the first 21 days of this year, we, we practice Deeper 21, 21 days committed to prayer and fasting. What does it look like to get in the game and read your Bible? And not just read your Bible, but study your Bible. Meditate on God's word. Memorize verses of scripture from there. What does it look like to get in the game and evangelize the gospel? I know you know this, and I don't need a response in order for me to feel affirmed, but there is a lost, hurting, and broken world on the outside of these four walls and whatever four walls of a room you're sitting in today. And they need the hope of Jesus. Can you say amen to that? And you have a story to tell. Revelation 12 says that we overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And you've got a testimony. You've got a story of how God brought you from death to life. So maybe you need to introduce someone to the gospel of Jesus. Or maybe you need to reintroduce someone to the story of Jesus. We talked about getting in the game with groups and how we're not created for quarantine. We're not created for isolation. That we are genuinely better together. And real life change happens in the context of relationships. We talked about getting in the game with tithing. And of all of these messages, if, if you missed any of them, go back and listen to this one because I don't want you to think that this church wants anything from you. We don't want anything from you. We believe that God has something for you. That's another good place to pause and say amen right there. But we also believe what the Bible says, that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So getting in the game and stewarding your finance as well and putting God first in the area of your money. And then, of course, last week, Pastor Ben talked about using your gifts, using your gifts and serving the local church, which is the bride of Christ. And so this has been, this has been the first seven weeks. I'm confident that this will be the final week in this particular series. And here's the word that the Lord dropped in my heart as we close out this whole conversation. I want to talk to you about the idea of worship of worship. Now here's the thing about the definition of worship is that it varies from individual to individual. And here's why. Because all of us have different backgrounds. We all come from different ethnicities. We all have different culture. We all have different faith backgrounds. We all have different experiences, whether that is life experiences or even church experiences. It's one of the beautiful things about Go Church is her diversity, is that we're all different people. We're not, we're not the same person. And so our definition of worship can vary because of our differing experiences. Let me, let me show you this. Now, this is a crowd participation moment, 
Everybody at this campus online and in Germantown, okay? I'm going to ask you a series of questions. If you find yourself in one of these categories, you've got to raise your hand, okay? If you don't raise your hand, God is watching. I just thought I'd throw that out there. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. A little participation here. How many of you, by show of hands, you would say that your experience, your church experience, means that in some way, shape, or form, you grew up in church. You went to church as a child. Come on, keep your hand up for just a moment, all right? That's a good majority of this room, all right? Hands down. Now you know that the Big C Church has been broken into denominations. So let's take this a step further. How many of you, by a show of hands, and this is me, you grew up Baptist. Come on, let me see your hands. Baptist. All right, hands down. How many of you grew up Presbyterian? Raise your hand. Thank you, sir. (laughs) All right, hands down. How many of you grew up non-denominational? Y'all didn't know what you were, huh? You're just like, you know what? We don't know what we are, so we just be non-denominational. How how many of you grew up... uh, Methodist, if you grew up Methodist, keep your hand up for just a moment. I want everybody to look around because you're witnessing a miracle. A Methodist raising their hand in church. Come on, somebody. How many of you grew up Catholic? Let me see your hand. Some of you are raising your hand for every single one of these. (laughs) All right, before you raise your hand on this one, if you grew up Pentecostal, raise both hands and shout loud. Come on, somebody. There we go. Y'all so wild, aren't you? Wild bunch. So you can see right there that our church experiences in itself will create a varying definition of what genuine, authentic worship really is. And then you look at the Western society, what culture has done, the trends and the undercurrents. And I mean, you look at, man, we live in a crazy world today, don't we? And so culture is now kind of jaded our definition of worship. It's It's provided more confusion than it has clarity. I came across uh, this quote some weeks back, and and I thought I'd share it with you. I don't know much about the author, Gordon Dahl, but he wrote this in 1972, and I think it's more appropriate in 2022 than it was, you know, 50 years ago, 40, 50 years ago. He says, we have become people who worship our work. We become people who work at our play, and we become a people who play at our worship. It's powerful, isn't it? And I, this, isn't, this is a judgment-free zone today. We can all be guilty of this very thing. We can all be guilty of worshiping our work and working at our hobbies and our extracurriculars and then just kind of playing with the idea or the concept of the spiritual discipline of worship. And can I tell you that worship is a powerful tool? Worship is a powerful tool. It's a weapon in your arsenal as you combat the attacks of the enemy. And it's nothing that you should play with. It's something that you should leverage and use. Can I get an amen from somebody that knows about the weapon of worship? Now, here's the truth. Regardless of those backgrounds, regardless of the different ethnicities, regardless of the different faith experiences, life experiences, church experiences, watch this. We all worship something. Every single one of us, we worship something. I'll give you a few examples here. And I don't know why all of these examples look like my high school report card. They start with the letter F. Come on now. But some of you worship your faith. And you get it. You understand it, that that there is a God that is sovereign and supreme. And he is the creator of all things. And because of him, you have life. Because of him, you have breath. Because of him you have hope. I wish you'd preach back at me. Come on now. And so we worship God, the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. And so our faith is a driving force of our worship. Some of you don't worship faith, but you worship your family. And listen, I've even said about my wife, Kimberly, I worship the very ground that you walk on. And I don't just love her on Valentine's Day. Come on, somebody. Like, I love Kimberly all the time. I love my wife. I love my children most days. (laughs) I adore them. I provide for them. I work hard for them. Come on. Uh, This past week was their winter break. I took them to the Great Wolf Lodge. Ow, ooh, come on. Because I love my family. I don't know why I howled like a wolf. It just felt right in the moment. I love my family. Some of you, though, you, you worship faith, you worship family. Some of us, and I, you, need to, you need to be honest here. 
We worship food. I love food. Come on. Can somebody just say, man, it's getting close to lunch. You're hungry. I'm hungry. Come on. Now, my little six-year-old daughter the other day, she had a little bad attitude. And I said, what's wrong? She said, I'm hangry. <laughs> At six years old. And I said, you are just like your mama, you know. <laughs> but I love you. I worship the ground that you walk on. We love food. And now, man, like Netflix and Hulu and all of these subscription channels and and, and on TV, they got the Food Network, and even Disney has the Disney Bake Off thing. Like, it's, it's food shows galore. How many of you watch some of those shows? I'm not going to punish you. You're so nervous to raise your hand, right? Like, we, when I was growing up, it was like, well, I can only remember one cooking show, and it was Julia Child. How many of you remember her, right? And by the time I started watching her, she started losing her mind just a little bit, but it made for great entertainment. And I love what Julia Chow always said. She said, a little bit of butter can make anything good. And I believe that to be a prophetic word for us today. A little bit of butter can make anything good. And we got food shows all the time, and, and we, we can worship food. And then there's football. Now, football can be synonymous with any hobby. It can be synonymous with any sport, any extracurricular activity. We worship sports. We worship athletics. This isn't a, a, a guilt message, by the way, but I do want to challenge you with a thought. We put a lot of time as parents in investing into our children and their athletics and hoping that they'll become a professional something or other. I read a statistic some years ago that said there's a 0.029% chance that your child will become a professional athlete. But listen to me, there is a 100% chance that your child will stand before God. Now listen, I want you to know this. We worship something, all of us. And here's, this will challenge your theology. I hope to do that a little bit today. But here's the thing about God. God's okay with you loving other things. He is the creator of all things. So God, God doesn't want you not to love your spouse. God doesn't want you not to love food. You need food for nourishment. You need food to survive. God doesn't want you not to enjoy hobbies and events and golf. Come on, somebody. I tell Kimberly all the time, God wants me to play golf. He wants, she doesn't buy into that as much, but it's not that he doesn't want you to enjoy the pleasures of life and the entertainment that's out there, but this is where I want to challenge you, where God gets really frustrated is when those things become an idol in your life. And we begin to worship those things more than we worship the God of all things. Come on, church. If you go back to the Ten Commandments, you look in Exodus chapter 20. The first commandment of the Ten Commandments, God says this, you shall have no other gods before me. And there's a couple of interesting points of this verse. God is lowercase g because there's only one OG, an original God. There's only one capital G, and it is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he says, you, you cannot have any other gods, and then here's the second part, before me. Love your family. Love the sports. Love your job. Love the vacation. Love all of the pleasures of life, but not more than you love me. Here's the verse, Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added unto it. And we oftentimes, and I've said this to you repeatedly, not just in this series, but in previous conversations, I've said this to you over and over and over again. We get that verse backwards. We seek first everything else that we want added and we play at our worship when it comes to God. I want that to sink in for just a moment. God wants you to enjoy the luxuries of life, but they cannot become idols. And I want to challenge you here for just a moment. I think that some of us have become so numb and so conditioned to the things that take up the majority of our time, our mental capacity, and even take up our heart that we fail to even recognize that we have elevated these lowercase g gods to the high place where the most high God should sit, and that is idolatry. You can fill in the blank with anything that's there. If it becomes the thing that you worship 
more than the one that created you to worship. It is an idol. And that idol must be torn down. I wish you'd say amen. Come on now. So at Christmas Eve, watch. At Christmas Eve, I talked about the law of first mention. And I've done this a few different times. I want to I do this with you today. The law of first mention means this. If you're studying a particular word or maybe you're looking at a particular uh, uh, definition, the purity of a definition of a word within the Bible, or maybe you've got this Bible study that you're doing, you want to dive a little bit deeper. One method to understand the purity of, of that topic or that word is to recognize the law of first mention. And what that means is, is you're going to go back to the very first place in the Bible in which that topic, that word, that, that concept was introduced, the law of first mention. So let's look at the the law of first mention around this particular question. Who was the first worshiper in the Bible? Now, before you say it out loud, because a moment ago, a lot of you raised your hand that you grew up in church. You know who this is. There are some people near you. They may not know who it is. So I want to be the one that gives the spoiler. All right, you ready? It's Lucifer. It's Satan. Satan, in the law of first mention, and I'll show this to you in, in a powerful way here in just a moment. Satan was the first worshiper in the Bible. He was an angel. And he was ordained, anointed, and appointed by God to lead the worship in heaven. Now, can we go on a little journey together? Come on, say yes. Come on, I want you to, all right? They've locked the doors. You can't leave. Come on now. Watch this. There are actually three angels in the Bible that have a name attached to them. Now, I want to ask you a question here, and I don't want you to feel any other way if you feel differently or believe differently than than some of us, but how many of you believe in angels? I I, I believe in angels. And by the way, the angels, the supernatural spiritual being of an angel is not a little cherub at Valentine that's floating around, you know, with a little, a little pew and a harp. No, the angels of God are an army. They are mighty. They are powerful. They are strong. They're not these cute little, oh, it's on my shoulder. No, 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 no. These are the angels of God, right? Now, there are three angels that have a name attached to them in the Bible. The first one is the archangel Michael. And Michael is always associated with the spiritual discipline of prayer. I'll show you one place in the scripture. In the Old Testament, Daniel, the book of Daniel, it is about Daniel, okay? And in Daniel chapter 10, Daniel is fasting for 21 days. That's why we call it a Daniel fast for 21 days. And Daniel is fasting because he doesn't want to be defiled by the culture uh, uh, of that area. He wants to remain pure and he wants to stay in alignment with God, right? So on day one, he begins to pray and he begins to fast. If you go to Daniel chapter 10, Uh, verses number 12, 13, and maybe 14, you'll see that the archangel Michael on the final day reveals himself to Daniel. And what does Michael say? Michael says that on the, oh, I'm about to preach this the way that I feel it. He says, on the first day that you begin to pray and fast, I was assigned to you on your behalf by God. And I heard your prayer on day one. But for 21 days, I have been in spiritual opposition. I've been in spiritual warfare that prevented me from getting to you because of the spirit of the kingdom of Persia. And he says, but now I am here. And I just want to encourage somebody for about 15 seconds. I know that you've been praying and I know you feel exhausted. I know that you feel tired, but there is an angel assigned to you an angel of prayer and God has heard every prayer that you have prayed don't quit praying come on if we're gonna clap let's do it well Woo! watch this then there's the archangel Gabriel and Gabriel anytime that Gabriel shows up in the Bible archangel Gabriel always has a word he always has a word Let me give you an example. Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse number 26. It was Gabriel that showed up to the Virgin Mary with a word. And what was his word to Mary? Mary, you have been given favor by God. You will conceive. Even though you're a virgin, you will become pregnant by the Holy Spirit and you will give birth to a child. God's child. Don't be afraid. You are to name that baby 
Jesus. And any time that Gabriel shows up, he always has a word. And then watch this. And then there's Lucifer. And Lucifer is all about worship. Let's pause here for just a moment. Prayer, word, worship. Those three areas are the fundamentals of the Christian faith. If you, don't, if you don't know where to start in this faith journey, start with the big three. And if you're just getting out of the gate in your faith walk, watch this. Just do each of these three for five minutes every day. I'm going to pray. I'm going to get into the word. And I'm going to take time to worship. There is power in these disciplines right here. Do you see that? Now, what happens is, is that Lucifer started to think more highly of himself than he ought to. And he wanted to elevate himself to the same level as the Most High God. So he was self-promoting. He wanted to be like God, have power like God, have knowledge like God, have wisdom like God. And so watch this. If you go to Isaiah, the Old Testament, chapter 14, you'll see the moment that Satan falls from heaven. Watch this. Isaiah chapter 14. Here's one verse and then we'll go back to the law of first mention. Let's read this together. One, two, three. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. Let's read it again because I think some of you didn't read it. You ready? One, two, three. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low. So in Isaiah... We see the prophet Isaiah explaining the very moment that Satan fell like lightning. That God cast the angel Lucifer from heaven. And Revelation talks about that in that moment, one third of all of the angels of heaven, one third of all of the angels of heaven fell with Lucifer down to the earth and one third of those angels became the devil's demons. Now, I'm not that great at math, but I'm good enough to tell you this, that even if one-third fell with Satan, there are still two-thirds on our side. Come on, somebody. Y'all not going to help me today. That's all right. When did this happen? When did Satan fall? Scholars and theologians, and I dare not put myself in the same category as those individuals, but I believe the same. Scholars and theologians believe that the moment that Satan fell from heaven the law of first mention, is found in Genesis 1, verse 1. The Bible says this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then there is a period. That period is the only place in all of the Bible that is not a period of punctuation, but it is rather a period of time. So scholars say, That in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, period. Now, from that period to Genesis 1 verse 2, that is known as the gap theory. They call it the gap theory because they believe that in that gap of time, in that period of time, that's when Lucifer and one-third of the angels fell from heaven and they were cast down to the earth. And that would only make sense because when you get to Genesis chapter 3, then you see the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden and they were tempted by who? Satan. Satan. So so the idea of the gap theory is that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, period, and then there is this gap of time. There's this period of time. And then Genesis 2, uh, 1 verse 2 says, and the earth was formless and empty and darkness hovered the earth, but the Spirit of God was hovering above the waters. And that period of time right there, it's believed that that's when Satan fell from heaven with one-third of his angels. Are you good today? Are we all right? I'm trying to teach you a little something here about worship. Now watch. Let's go back to Isaiah. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. And then watch this. Lucifer, he makes five I will statements. Here's what he says. I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. Watch what he says. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like 
the Most High. Listen to me. I just want to say this to you in the most loving, grace-filled, but matter-of-fact way. Anytime that you begin to put any lowercase g God in the seat of the Most High, you and I are acting just like the devil. That's hard, but it's true. There is a way that seems right unto a man, but in the end it leads to death and destruction. And I don't know what those idols are in your life. I know the areas that I have to be very guarded and careful in my life. But any time that I try to promote myself or some other lowercase g God to the seat of the most high God, I will be cast down too. My name will not be written in the Lamb's book of life. Are you hearing what I'm trying to say? Verse 15. But you brought down to the realm of the dead to the depths of the pit. Now, I've given you a ton of Old Testament examples. Let's go to the New Testament. So now we see, and the law first mentioned through that gap theory, that Lucifer, he self-promoted to try to be equal to God, the Most High God. God sent him down to the earth, right? He tempted Adam and Eve in the garden. And now God sends his only begotten son, Jesus, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting, eternal life. The Gospels, they record the, the early days of the ministry of Jesus. Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist. Uh, heaven opens, a dove lights on the shoulder of Jesus. And over the intercom of heaven, God speaks and says, This is my son, and whom I'm, I'm well pleased. And then the ministry of Jesus begins. And what happens? For 40 days, the devil tempts Jesus. The devil tests Jesus. And I want you to see, I just want you to see real quick, I hope you're getting this the way that I feel it in my heart. The enemy says this, watch. If you worship me, it will all be yours. And this has been the lie that's been told for centuries since. That if you worship whatever this world offers, because the devil is the enemy of the world, Amen. then it will all be yours. And I love, if you read, especially in Luke 4, but any of this story in the other Gospels, I love Jesus' quick one-sentence responses to the enemy every time he's tested and tempted. But Jesus answered when Satan says, hey, if you worship me, it, it, all, it all can be yours. And Jesus says, no, it is written. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. I just had this thought. Don't want it to scare you. Didn't tell the first gathering this. If I never preach another message, if this is the last sermon that I ever get, if for some reason God calls me home or whatever other reason they don't let me on the stage, security steps in and says, you can't go up there. I want to leave you with this message. Worship the Lord your God only. Only Jesus. <laughs> Worship the Lord only. My life is divided almost in two, right down the middle. The first half of my life without Jesus, the second half with Jesus. The first half I chased after everything the world had to offer me. And it was all counterfeit to the real thing. But in 1999, I met a man named Jesus. And not every day since that day that I gave my heart to the Lord have, have I been perfect. But I can tell you this is the best decision I've ever made. To worship the Lord only. To bring down those idols. And to let the Most High be seated in the right place. That is worship. Wor worship is hard to define. It's like someone asking you, what is beauty? And the response to that would be, beauty is in the eye of 
The beholder, what does that mean? It means that that beauty is defined by the observer. And I'll prove it to you. Kimberly thinks I'm fine because I'm her definition of beauty. And some of you think she's blind. And worship is similar. It's really hard to define. I'll give you maybe a working definition that the Lord just put on my heart. But I can tell you a few things that worship is not. Worship is not an event. We do worship nights and we can schedule moments of worship. But worship is more than an event on a calendar. It's more than a church gathering on a Sunday. And Jesus said in Matthew, he said, they, they, they draw near me with their, with their mouth, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts, their hearts are far from me. That's why week in and week out and Sunday after Sunday, you can come to, come to Go Church or any other church and never really experience worship, genuine, authentic worship, because you think that worship is an event. Worship is not an event. Let me tell you something else. Worship is not music. Music is just a vehicle that leads us to the intimate place of worship with God. But worship, worship is not music. I love the fact that we've got, hey, and I'm not comparing us to any other church, but we got a fantastic worship team. I'm telling you, they are awesome. We got a music director at both of our campuses. We have worship leaders. We got a front line of people. And they can just sing, can't they? Because you know there's a difference between singing and singing, right? You know that, okay. And then, and then we got a, here at our South Metro Atlanta campus, we have a worship choir. Come on, bring the choir back. And watch, I love all of that. But those individuals and the music that they produce is not worship. Music is not worship and worship is not music. Music is just a vehicle that allows us to go on a, on a, on a ride to the deep place with God. Does that make sense? Worship, worship's not a performance. If you ever, and again, I'm not trying to give you a spiritual spanking here, but if you ever come into a, a gathering and you try to grade our worship, we're not the one that's wrong. It's your heart that is wrong. I, I, lo I love all this. I love the panels and I love the lights. I love that we leverage technology, but this is not a theater and I'm not an actor. And this isn't a concert that you paid to get into to come watch your favorite band. This is about us gathering together, lifting up our hands to worship the Most High God that saved us from the very pit of hell, that rescued us and turned our life around. Are you hearing what I'm trying to preach to you? No, we, live, we live in an entertainment culture, and yet we can be guilty sometimes of following those trends but listen to me I don't ever want you to think that I that I'm up here like the the circus trying to get this team to perform it's not about an audience it's only about the audience of one and you can testify about this in your own life but there have been moments that I have felt the power of God in my car just like I felt the power of God in this room come on there have been moments where the Holy Spirit has showed up and there wasn't any music playing, and there wasn't any lights and fog. No, it was just the power of God moving. Oh, I wish you'd help me today, come on. Oh, worship, worship's not a feeling. It's not a feeling. Well, I hope they play my favorite song so I can feel good. No, you know how I know that worship isn't a feeling because some of the most powerful moments of worship that I've ever had is when I didn't feel like worshiping. When I didn't feel like praying, but I pressed through anyway and God showed up. When I didn't feel like reading my Bible, but I did anyway and God showed up. Where I didn't feel like preaching, but I knew that the Lord has anointed me for such a time as this and I preached anyway. Where I didn't want to lift my hands because of all the stuff that we have been going through, but I sacrificed and lifted my hands anyway and there was a breakthrough. Or Worship's not a feeling. Wor worship can be emotional, but emotionalism doesn't mean you've worshiped. Well, I know I worship God today because I stood, couldn't stop crying. I cried when the Bulldogs won the national championship. 
but I wasn't worshiping them. Come on. It's not a feeling. Watch this. Write this down. It's not on the screen. Worship is not a feeling. Worship is a filling. It's a refueling. It's God encouraging us in our faith walk. And maybe you feel low today. Maybe you feel like throwing in the towel. Just worship your way through. Worship is greater than your worry. And praise is greater than your pain. Come on, church. So here's what worship is. It's just our response to God for who he is and all that he's done. That's the homework, by the way. I want you to write down this week, who is God to you? When you begin to express who God is to you, you can't help but worship the one that gave you not just earthly life, but the hope of eternal life. And let me tell you this, and all that he's done, the old school church would say it this way, if God never does another thing for me, he's already done enough. For God so loved the world, he gave his son for you and for me. What else do we need? So when I worship, I'm worshiping because because of who you are and because of your love that you've given to me. Another way that I would say this is this way, I don't worship God because of what he will do for me. I worship God because of who he is to me. Who is he to you? When you can define that, you can worship in any circumstance. The Bible says it this way. I want you to see this scripture here, 1 John 4, 19. And I want you to read this in a personal way. I want you to read it with, I love him because he first loved me. Can we do that? One, two, three. I love him because he first loved me. One more time. I love him because he first loved me. I mean, worship is more than just singing in church. True worship is a lifestyle. I was telling my kids uh, last night, I didn't preach them this whole message. They would have been bored like some of you are. But I told them, I was like, you know what? When it comes to worship, you can worship all day, every day, regardless of what you're doing. Worship can be your life. It's worshiping God with all of your heart. It's worshiping God at all times. It's worshiping God with your life. So everything I do, God, I'm doing this to the glory of God. From leading my family to pastoring this church, to you leading your company or doing your trait or whatever it is, everything I do, I do to worship you. So here's the last thought, watch. The whole series of get in the game, it's all worship. Every bit of it is worship. When I pray, I worship you. When I fast, I worship you. When I read the Bible, I worship you. I don't do these things to cross them off of a religious to-do list. No, I do them because of who you are to me. I share the gospel because I worship you and you changed my life and I want you to change the lives of others. I get in a group because I need community in life and that's how I worship you is to draw closer to you and my brothers and sisters in the faith. I put my my money, my treasure in the right place and the right priority because I wanna prove to you that I worship you. I serve because I worship you. All right, I always close, at least in this series with these two questions. So what did the Holy Spirit speak to your heart today? And what next next steps do you need to take on your faith journey? So every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to close this way. Thank you, Jesus. For some of you, the next step is allowing God to get back on the throne of your heart to remove those false gods, those idols, and to invite the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to be your personal savior. That's either a first time commitment for some of you or it's a recommitment for others. But if this message has spoken to your heart and you've recognized that there's some areas in my life that have taken precedent and priority over God, get your heart right with God today, right now. I'm counting to three. If that's you, nobody's looking but me. I want you to raise your hand. You ready? One, two, three, if that's you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. In the back, thank you. Anybody else? In the middle section, 
My left, your right. Keep them up. I'm coming your way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Lord, you've seen every hand that's been raised today. And I'm at thank you, sir. And I'm trusting you, Jesus, that we're tearing down idols. And we're putting you at the right place so that we can worship you and you alone. Forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of being blind even to the areas that we promoted. God, tear that down. You deserve our worship. You deserve our highest praise and thanksgiving and gratitude and honor and appreciation. So Lord, help us to change some things in our lives, in our spiritual walk, in our family, in our scheduling. Forgive us of our sin. Make us a new person. And thank you. Thank you for being the most high God. There is no God like you. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said amen and amen. Can we just love on Jesus together? Come on.